Chapter Eight of Jetta of the Lowlands by Ray Cummings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Jetta's Defiance. I must go back now to picture what befell Jetta that afternoon while I was at Spawn's mine. It is not my purpose to becloud this narrative with mystery. There was very little mystery about it to Jetta, and I can reconstruct her viewpoint of the events from what she afterward told me. Jetta's room was in the wing of the house on the side near the pergola. Her window and door looked out upon the patio. When I had retired that first night in Narita, Spawn had gone to his daughter and unbraided her for showing herself while he was giving me that first midnight meal. Stay in your room. You have nothing to do with him, hear me? Yes, father. From her infancy, he had dominated her. It never occurred to either of them that she could disobey, and yet this time she did, for no sooner was he asleep that night than she came to my window, as I have told. The next day, Jetta dutifully had kept herself secluded. She cooked her own breakfast while I was at the government house and was again out of sight by noon. Jetta was nearly always alone. I can picture her sitting there within the narrow walls of her little room. Boys, ragged garb. All possible femininity stripped from her. Yet within her, the woman's instincts were struggling. She sewed a great deal. She since has told me, there in that cloistered dimness, making little dresses of silk and bits of finery given her surreptitiously by the neighbor woman. Gazing at herself in them with the aid of a tiny mirror, hiding them away, never daring to wear them openly, until at intervals her father would raid the room, find them, and burn them in the kitchen incinerator. Instincts of Satan, by damned, I will get these woman's instincts out of you, Jetta. And there were hours when she would try to read hidden books and look at pictures of the strange fairy world of the highlands. She could read and write a little. She had gone for a few years to the small Narita government school, and then been snatched from it by her father. When Spawn and I had finished that noonday meal, I recall that he left me for a moment. He had gone to Jetta. I am taking the young American to the mine. I will return presently. Stay close, Jetta. Yes, father. He left with me, Jetta remaining in her room, her thoughts upon the coming night. She trembled at them. She would meet me again this evening in the moonlit garden. The sound of a man walking the garden path aroused her from her reverie. Then came a soft, ingratiating voice. Jetta, chica mia. It was Perona, standing by the pergola preening his effeminate mustache. Jetta, little lovebird, come out and talk to me. Jetta slammed the window slide and sat quiet. Jetta, it is your Greco. Well, do I know it, she muttered. Jetta, he strolled down the path and back. Jetta, his voice began rising into a strident, peevish anger. Jetta, are you in there, Chica? Answer me. No answer. Jetta, poor Dios. He fumed, then fell to pleading. Are you in there? Please, little lovebird, answer your Greco. Are you in there? Yes. Come out, then. Come to Greco. She said sweetly, My father does not want me to talk to men. You know that is so, Senor Perona. It grounded him. Why? Is it not so? Yes, but I am not. A man? Little imp? She relished impaling him upon the shafts of her ridicule. Her sport was interrupted by the arrival of Spawn. He had left me at the mine and come directly back home. Jetta heard his heavy tread on the garden path, then his voice. Ah, Perona. And Perona. Jetta will not come out and talk to me. The waxen, mustached minister of Narita's internal affairs 
was like a sulky child. But Spawn was unimpressed. Spawn said, Well, let her alone. We have more important things to engage us. I have the American occupied at the mine. You heard from De Beer? I went last night. All is ready as we planned. But Spawn, this fool of an American, this Grant. Hush, not so loud, Perona. I am telling you. Perona was excited. His voice rose shrilly. But Spawn checked him. Shut up, you waste time. Tell me exactly the arrangements with De Beer. La Grande Coup. Now, tonight, most important of nights, and you rant of your troubles with a girl. They were standing by the pergola, quite near Jetta's shaded window. She crouched there, listening to them. None of this was entirely new to Jetta. She had always been aware, more or less, of her father's secret business activities. As a child, she had not understood them, nor did she now, with any clarity. Spawn had always talked freely within her hearing, ignoring her, though occasionally he threatened her to keep her mouth shut. She heard now fragments of this discussion between her father and Perona. They moved away from the pergola and sat by the fountain, speaking too low for her to hear. And then they paced the path, coming nearer, and she caught their voices again. And occasionally they grew excited or vehement, and then their raised tones were plainly audible to her. And this is what she heard, with what she knew already, and with what subsequently transpired, enables me now to piece together the facts into a connected explanation. In the establishment of a cinnabar mine some years before, Spawn was originally financed by Perona. The South American was then newly made minister of Narita's internal affairs. He became Spawn's business partner. They kept the connection secret. Spawn falsified his production records, and Perona, with his government position, was enabled to pass these false accounts of the mine's production. Narita was systematically cheated of a portion of its legal share. But this, after a time, did not satisfy the ambitious Perona and Spawn. They began to plan how they might engage in smuggling some of their quicksilver into the United States. Perona, during these years, had ambitions of his own in other directions. President Marx of Narita was an honest official. He handicapped Perona considerably. There were many ways by which Perona could have grown rich through a dishonest handling of the government affairs. It was done almost universally in all the small Latin governments, but Marx as president made it dangerous in Narita. Even the duplicity with the mine was a precarious affair. There was at this time in Narita a young adventurer named De Beer, a handsome, swaggering fellow in his late twenties. He was a good talker, he spoke many languages. He could orate with fluency and skillful guile. His smile, his colorful personality, and his gift for oratory made it easy for him to stir up dissatisfaction among the people. De Beer became known as a patriot. A revolution in Narita was brewing. Perona, as Narita's minister, was De Beer's political enemy. The Narita government ran De Beer out ending the potential revolution. But Perona and Spawn had always secretly been friends with De Beer. It would have been very handy to have this unscrupulous young scoundrel as president. When De Beer was banished with some of his most loyal followers, he began a career of petty banditry in the lowland depths. Spawn and Perona kept in communication with him, and, by a method, which was presently made startling clear to Jetta and me, De Beer smuggled the quicksilver for Perona and Spawn. It was this activity which had finally aroused my department and caused Hanley to send me to Narita. This, however, was a dangerous, precarious occupation. De Beer did not seem to think so or care. 
but Perona and Spawn, with their established positions in Narita, were always fearful of exposure. Even without my coming, they had planned to disconnect from the beer. And for more than that, as Jetta had one day heard Perona remark to her father, I'll tell you that this de beer is not very straight with us, Spawn. De beer would, on occasion, fail to make proper return for the smuggled product. So now they planned the last coup in which de beer was to help, and then they would be done with him, the two of them, Spawn and Perona, would remain as honest citizens of Narita, and de beer had agreed to take himself away and pursue his banditry elsewhere. It was a simple plan. It promised to yield a high stake quickly, a final fling at illicit activity, then virtuous reformation, with Perona marrying the little Jetta. Beneath the strong room at the mine, Perona and Spawn had secretly built a cleverly concealed little vault. De Beer, this night, just before the midnight hour, was to attack the mine. Spawn and Perona had bribed the police guards to submit to this attack. The guards did not know the details. They only knew that De Beer and his men would make a sham attack. Careful to harm none of them, and then De Beer would withdraw. The guards would report that they had been driven away by a large force, and when the excitement was over, the ingots of radiumized quicksilver would have vanished. De Beer, making a way into distant lowland fastness, would obviously be supposed to have taken the treasure. But Perona, hidden alone in the strong room, would merely carry the ingots down into the secret vault to be disposed of at some future date. The ingots were well insured by an international company against theft. The Narita government would receive one-third of that insurance as recompense for the loss of its share. Peron and Spawn would get two-thirds and have the treasure as well. Such was the present plan into which, all unknown to me, I had been plunged, and my presence complicated things considerably, so much so that Perona grew vehement this afternoon in the garden, explaining why. His shrill voice carried the Jetta, in spite of Spawn's effort to shut him up. I tell you that Americano agent will undo us. How? demanded the calmer Spawn. Already he has made Mark suspicious. Chut, you can be fool, Marks, Perona. You have for years been doing it. This meddling fellow, he has met Jetta, I do not believe it. There was a sudden grimness in Spawn's tone at the thought. I do not believe it. Jetta would not dare. You should have seen him flush when Marx mentioned at the conference this morning that I am to marry Jetta. No one could miss it. He has met her, I tell you, and it must have been last night. So you say. Jetta could see her father's face, white with suppressed rage. You think that? and that this Grant might be your rival? That worries you. Not our plans for tonight, which have real importance, but worrying over a girl. She would not talk to me. She would not come out. He has no doubt put wild ideas into her head. Spawn, you listen to me. I have always been more clever than you at scheming. Is it not so? You have always said it. I have a plan now. It fits our arrangements with the beer but it will rid us of this Americano. When all is done, and I have married Jetta, Spawn interrupted impatiently. You will marry Jetta, never fear. I have promised her to you. And because, as Jetta well knew, Perona had made it part of his bargaining in financing Spawn. But this they did not now mention. To get rid of this grant, well, that sounds meritorious. He is dangerous around here. To that I agree. And with Jetta? Have done, Perona. With sudden decision, Spawn leaped to his feet. I do not believe she would have dared talk to Grant. We'll have her out and ask her, if she has, by the gods. It fell upon Jetta before she had time to gather her wits. Spawn 
strode to her door and found it fastened on the inside. Jetta, open at once. He thumped with his heavy fists. Confused and trembling, she unsealed it, and he dragged her out into the sunlight of the garden. Now then, Jetta, you have heard some of what we have been saying, perhaps. Father, about this young American, this Grant. She stood cringing in his grasp. Spawn had never used physical violence with Jetta, but he was white with fury now. Father, you, you are hurting me. Perona interposed. Wait, Spawn, not so rough. Let me talk to her. Jetta, chica mia, your Greco is worried. The hell with that, Spawn shouted. But he released the girl, and she sank trembling to the little seat by the pergola. Spawn stood over her. Jetta, look at me. Did you meet, did you talk to Grant last night? She wanted to deny it. She clung to his angry gaze, but the habit of all her life of truthfulness with him prevailed. Yes, she admitted. End of chapter 8